the phrase uh, biting an iron bowl or something like that uh, was coming to mind. I, I want to talk about the Bodhisattva vow and um, it feels um, like a big, huge topic. Um, so the invitation is to explore with me uh, for the next just little bit. And um, and we'll see where we go. Um, so this arose strongly for me recently. Um, some of you know that I was I was away for a month, um, and I was in India um, with my son. Um, I was invited as his, somebody correct me if it's one plus or plus one, I don't seem to retain that, that term, whichever it is, I was his date <laughs> to go to a wedding in Bangalore. And um, because it's such a long ways away, um, we arranged to have it be a month long trip. And um, I got to travel with him for a month. And one of the places that we um, ended up going, which was not on our itinerary to go, but where we ended up going is Dharmasala, um, the uh, location of the, the Dalai Lama's um, life in exile. Um, and um, during the time I was there, I discovered this little Buddhist Tibetan Buddhist retreat center called Tushita Meditation Center. Um, and their, um, their title for their center is Buddhist Philosophy and Needs for Ultimate Happiness. Um, and um, it's a really lovely, lovely place. Um, and their teacher, um, who I've come to understand is, was a very well-known Rinpoche, had passed away when I was there about a month before. And so they were doing um, some pujas for him. Uh, and it was kind of interesting because it was for basically to enc uh, encourage a quick reincarnation for him. And my first response was, geez, the guy doesn't get a break, right? Everybody's praying for him to come right back. <laughs> but um, I kind of came to see, and this, this you know, kind of folds in with the Bodhi, talk about the Bodhisattva vow. I came to see that um, uh, they're praying for him to fulfill his vow as a Bodhisattva. Um, to um, to to be a vehicle for relieving suffering for others, and um, they it was a really beautiful center, and there were a number of places on walls at the center where there were, for lack of a better way to put it, kind of slogans painted on the walls, um, and I know this one really touched me and it is kind of provoked why I wanted to talk about the Bodhisattva vow in our practice. Those wishing to quickly rescue oneself and others need to practice the most sacred secret, the exchange of self with others. Those wishing to quickly rescue oneself and others need to practice the most sacred secret, the exchange of self with others. And there was another, um, another longer um, kind of statement painted on the wall about um, self-cherishing and the relief of suffering through our relief from self-cherishing. Now, um, why I feel like this is sort of like biting the iron bowl is 
talking about um, the Bodhisattva vow feels like in, in our contemporary practice, it feels like something that can be up for a lot of misunderstanding. So, you know, we, we have, I, I have, um, and I think many of us have come to really um, value self-compassion and kindness in practice. And um, I know for myself, maybe you can relate, maybe you can't. Um, I, I really threw myself against the wall, almost literally, of trying to annihilate myself as my understanding of what no self was. And so, you know, and there's the, our famous um, phrase from Dogen of to study the self, to study Buddhism is to study the self and to study the self is to forget the self. And many of us come in to practice, I think wanting to skip over that study the self part and just let me get rid of all that that I don't like about myself and become some better human or even better than a better human. <laughs> Let me become some transformed being, um, which, which, which um, applying ourselves to, I think practice does transform us. Um, And central to the Mahayana way that we've inherited is this bodhisattva vow. This vow to raise the body mind. I'm, I'm amazed participating in Gate of Fruit Nectar. Um, it's so, it's so visceral the way in which we're called upon to identify with all the energy and really um, dedicate our efforts to the realization, our realization and the realization of all beings to be free from suffering. It's, it's constant in it. Um, in a very almost like a molecular kind of way, in a very, um, uh, maybe that's what tantric is. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I was so um, impacted, affected, inspired, um, being in this environment of Tibetan Buddhism in Dharamsala to really um, investigate what is my manifestation of the Bodhisattva vow? How do I really live that? And one of the things I think that might be helpful, I hope, is that that we can embrace incrementalism, <laughs> that being dedicated to a life of being loving and kind and considerate and really beginning to exercise our capacity to exchange self for other in terms of really like just flat out understanding where other people are coming from. And I had an experience this morning <laughs> in looking at my news feed uh, from the New York Times. And my immediate response was quite angry at how some other people think. And so knowing I, I've been focused on this topic and thinking about that, it's like, how do I, how do I investigate my response from a perspective of 
of exchanging myself for other, of how, what might be the energy going into that for someone else and what might be their sufferings and frustrations. And can I at least open up to uh, not seeing it from a one-dimensional perspective? Other, me, wrong, right? Totally deluded. Um, so kind of taking a little bit of a step backwards and maybe taking a little, creating a little bit of context around this. So from a Mahayana perspective, from, a, from the, the perspective of the, in, of the practice that we inherit um, through, through Zen and specific through, through our lineage of white plum of Zen, the, the understanding and the, the basic intention is this bodhisattva vow, is this vow to raise the bodhi mind and raise our enthusiasm, energy, passion, um, devotion, longing for awakening, to be awake in our lives, to be fully open to the experience of being alive in this moment, exactly as it is, just this as it is. Um, And we were having a conversation in our sitting group on Thursday night, and and it, all that feels like it's you know my passion, my devotion, my my intention, and and kind of flipping it over of is that the Bodhi mind calling us home? We feel it because we already know this is my true nature this complete unification with life and all things. Um, and really it's just keeping on remembering and keeping on revealing that as opposed to pushing through to something that is, is not already existing, is not already part of our intrinsic nature. And there's, there's a little inkling in me around the Bodhisattva vow to realize that this idea that I will not enter nirvana until all beings enter nirvana, right? That's the Bodhisattva vow, the Mahayana way. That is that just skillful means to realize we are always inherently connected to everything. And therefore, making that vow is just, yeah, pick up one thing and the whole world comes with it. And like the Buddha said upon awakening, touching the earth, I, all sentient beings, the great earth, simultaneously attain the land. It doesn't, it doesn't get picked up separate from that. So how does the how does having this central central and let's put it that way of our practice um, to relieve our suffering and the suffering of others, um, how does that really help us to really see the fundamental nature of our life as it is? Um, how the sense of un, unspecific, non-specificity, which we could call emptiness, the ultimate reality, and the, the dharma of, dharma gates are, are uh, numberless. Um, how does this vow um, to relieve suffering really serve us in seeing the basic nature of reality. And, and I think it does. Um, to 
so it's going to read if I do this one. And this is from um, the Shambhala um, Dictionary of Buddhism and Zen, Bodhisattva. <clears throat> In Mahayana Buddhism, a Bodhisattva is a being who seeks Buddhahood through the systematic practice of perfect virtue, the paramitas, but renounces complete entry into nirvana until all beings are saved. A bodhisattva provides active help, is ready to take upon himself suffering of beings and transfer his own karmic merit to other beings. And the way of the bodhisattva begins with arousing the thought of enlightenment, bodhicitta, and taking the bodhisattva vow. And this I thought was super helpful. I hope it's helpful to you. The Mahayana distinguishes two kinds of bodhisattvas, earthly and transcendent. Earthly bodhisattvas are persons who are distinguished by their compassion and altruism, as well as their striving toward the attainment of enlightenment. Transcendent bodhisattvas have already realized all the parties and basically are just one step before being a fully, a full Buddha. But they're holding back because of that bodhisattva vow. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm I'm not finding it terribly helpful to focus on the holding back part. Um, it might feel like it's uh, self-sacrificing in the extreme. Yeah. If I'm right on the threshold of full enlightenment, I don't want to hold back. Who does? But I think that um, it's not the thing to focus on. <laughs> and um, and if we were in that space, you know, who knows what we're thinking or feeling. But I think that what is has a lot of utility is just in how we live. And Again, check into your own experience because that's all I'm really speaking from. Um, but the, the, I think that the habit of mind to be so self preoccupied as we tend to be, um, I was even noticing this week how much of my mental space is really just preoccupied with narrating my experience not only narrating my experience, but sort of like, I, I remember somebody talked about it like a news broadcaster. I think it was Gimpo. Like not only narrating my own experience to myself, but sort of like as if I'm narrating it to someone else. I don't know if you have that experience, but, um, but basically so much of it is here. And how does this sense of relieving ourselves from the preoccupation of self clinging um, really is a gift for opening up to the freshness and aliveness of life. And it doesn't mean this one here is not deserving of self-compassion too. This one here is part of the Bodhisattva vow. But how do we extend it a little bit bigger than that? And that's where I think embracing incrementalism and just, you know, how do I get up in the morning and say, my intention is to be as kind and loving as I can be today and respectful of whoever I might and whatever I might encounter. And, and that much, we can all do. And we will fall short. But that is the purpose of vow or intention is like, the, like a guiding 
you know, as they say, a moral compass. And actually in that, um, the Bodhisattva is the Bodhisattva Silla. So that's the morality aspect of our practice. The precepts and the paramitas are termed the Bodhisattva Sila. So there's, they're what helps guide us around our intention, around the Bodhisattva vow. Um, I'll just maybe make one more comment and then see what your comments are. Um, we had a, a very nice community council yesterday um, around formal practice and intensive practice. And so Sashin and Ango and um, Bhagavan Kai and other forms of extended um, meditation practice. And um, I think it's just, you know, maybe to look at how those kinds of um, structures that we can put ourselves in help to settle the mind um, over some time um, to really allow these central, I think central longings um, that we all share to kind of come to the surface. Um, and, you know, really that's like Sashin, that's the definition, unify the mind. So I'm going to stop. I feel like I've been lecturing. So I apologize uh, for that. Um, but let me know your thoughts. <laughs>